Yeah. Amen. Amen. I should have also mentioned, I know you wrote it down Sunday morning, but uh, I did call Brother Noah Sunday, uh, Monday morning, Excellent. Monday evening, and he is, his, his oxygen level is, is dropping into the 60s. And uh, they want him to start on oxygen, and he's kind of resisting that. He said he was there, and the, they did his oxygen, and said, your oxygen is 95, you're fine, Mr. Bullis. He said, well, let me walk across the room, walk to the end of her office, and came back. And it was 64. I said, Noah, you're in danger, son, anytime it's below 85. What's wrong with you? And he, uh, so I don't know if he's going to take them serious and start using oxygen or not, but Noah's lungs are really bad, guys. And he, uh, he does need your prayers this evening, okay? All right, so <clears throat> Psalm 27. I hope we're going to cover three Psalms. And next week will be our last study in Psalms. And then that's next week is the last. Wednesday of summer, and uh, Sister Vicki and I are already talking about it. Uh, summer's coming to an end. I don't like that, but it is. And uh, so we will end our book of Psalms, and then the following week, the Lord's willing, we will start uh, into the book of Second Corinthians. We'll do a study or two, and then Brother Jeremy will bring the Word of God again for us on Wednesday night. I tell you, if you weren't here and heard the Word that Brother Jeremy brought, I'm telling you, it was powerful. I mean, it was it was one of the best. Me- I meant to tell you, preacher, that was one of the best, clearest, understandable messages on that on the miracle that's in actually all four gospels, <laughs> and uh, and it was a great job. I appreciated that. Of course, I love the book of Matthew, so it's <laughs> it's I'm I'm a little biased, maybe, but so Psalm 27. If Psalm 26, and I'm sure that it was where we stopped at our last study. It was written during the time of famine in 2 Samuel chapter 21. And Saul had killed some of the Gibeonites and he should not have done that. And so God had punished them because God was honoring an agreement made with Joshua 400 years. You say 400 years. Hey, listen. God's word never changes. When he makes an agreement or a promise, it is for eternity. Or as long as this world lasts, if it's an, if it's an earthly promise. Then, then chapter 27 is the end of that chapter. And so I think, and I think that's certainly what happened. Let me read to you the end of that chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 21. This is no particular order. It's just a collection of victories over the Philistines. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war against Israel, and David went down. And his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. This time, David is about six. When the quits, quits going out with the army, he's in his mid to late sixties. Very young, Sister Wanda. I want you on my side, okay? <laughs> All right. So, uh, so he, uh, so this is after that time. It's, I mean, it's around that time, sixty-five to seventy years old, and Ishabai Benab which is one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, <coughs> thought to have slain David. Now this is some kin to Goliath, and so uh, maybe he was already promised to get Goliath's swords, but we know David has that. For whatever reason, he has a new sword. David is pinned down. But Abishai, which we've seen before in 1 Samuel, a brave man about David's age, his nephew, though, from one of his older sisters. But Abishai, the son of Zerah, succored him and said, smote the, the Philistine and killed him. Then, I, then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to the battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. They called him the light of Israel. That's a kind thing to say. And it came to pass after this that there was a giant, there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachah, the Hushuite, slew Saif, which was of the son of the giant. And then it goes on to go and tell you another one, how big he was. And he gets killed. And then there was another giant. It's our fourth one. Had six fingers on every hand, six toes on each foot. And... <coughs> When he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, 
the brother of David, another one of David's nephews, killed these. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hands of his servants. So this is that time frame that, that God has given them victory and, and during David's life, the Philistines will be subdued. And uh, so we thank the Lord for that. So let's see how, what David has to say now that the army won't let him go out and fight anymore, okay? The Lord is my light. <laughs> you might think I'm the light of Israel, <laughs> but the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall, shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, and of whom shall I be afraid? I may be old, <laughs> but my strength never gets old in the Lord. <laughs> and you can tell he's kind of fired up as he's writing this, can't you? you know? But by the way, there's something very special in this first verse. The Lord is my life. That's the first time in the Bible that God is referred to as the light. In the New Testament, Jesus is called the light of the world. That's a reference that happens many other times. This is the first time it ever happens. Jesus, God is associated with light. Let there be light. And, and some of the prophets would, would call him the light, you know, uh, 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 talk about the light of God, but this is the first time anyone has ever said, God is my light. And so we think of that now so often. We talk about Jesus being our light. And he lights up our way, you know. But this is the first time. The Lord is the strength of my life. I don't have to be afraid. When the wicked, even my enemies, my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh. You see, they stumbled and fell. I wonder if David thinks somehow if his nephew had stayed out of the fight. I might have had me another big victory over that giant. But you know other men need victories too. Guys, there's a real lesson there for you and me. You don't, you don't have to be always the hero. Sometimes God wants somebody else to be the hero. And you need to let them be. You need to let them learn the lessons that they need to learn. This is a song of confidence. In fact, there are several psalms of confidence. And we, uh, in our outline, I wish I, I have mine, but I don't want to dig it out of our outline on the book of Psalms. But this is one of the psalms, one of the songs of confidence. Confident in God's desire. God, confident in God's power. My light. By the way, there's a little side note about this light thing. In Isaiah... 49, I wrote this down. It repeated in Acts 13. It says that God is the light and salvation, the same two things that he says here. God is my light and my salvation. <clears throat> it says that God will be the light and the salvation of the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul and Barnabas repeat this in, in Acts 13 repeat the prophecy of, of Isaiah 49 saying this is fulfilled God is going to save a great number of Gentiles and now look how many far more Gentiles believe in Jesus Christ than Jews millions of us across the world that believe in Jesus Christ God chose to save us and you got to understand in the Jews mind more than one rabbi wrote this statement the only reason that Gentiles are in the world is to be fire for the fuels of hell, fuel for the fires of hell. That's what they thought about us. That's all God thought about us. So, so anyhow, so I that, thought that's pretty good. When the wicked, even my enemies, my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they shall stumble. They stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war. War, let me underline that, I didn't, I should have. The war rise against me, and this I will be confident. Now, what is he going to be confident in? What we're about to read is David's singular dynamics of his life. Here it is. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. What is it? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Wow. Wow. I want to be in God. There was no tabernacle yet. I mean, no, no tent. I mean, no uh, uh, temple yet. But David had moved years before this, the tabernacle and built, a, and built the Ark of the Covenant and built a new tabernacle according to the instructions of Moses. 
made a new beautiful holy of holies like it had been 500 years before. God had blessed David. And he makes this beautiful tabernacle with plans to have a permanent beautiful temple that will rival anything in all the world. And he gathers all the materials to build it. God says to him, you can't build it. <laughs> You're a man of blood. But I'll allow your son to build it. I think David would have been happy to have not been a king and been a priest. Been a, a Levite and got to stay in God's house. And worship God and praise his name and sing the songs. What a desire that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, here's another why. What was his singular purpose in life? To be in God's house. Why did he want to be in God's house? To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire, pray, in his temple. He calls it a temple, but we know the temple is actually not built yet. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the Hebrew word for temple like Solomon's temple. It means a uh, house, really. So it could have been translated house again. But so, so I want to be there and inquire, to pray, to know God deeper. I want to inquire in his temple. Not just pray, but to get to know God better. I think so often about something the Apostle Paul said after years of being a missionary and writing much of, much of the Bible already, the New Testament. He says this, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. You think that Paul knew Christ as well as anyone could know Christ. But he still had a desire, a longing to inquire and to know Jesus Christ better. I hope that never dies in you and me. I don't think it is. That's why you're here this evening. Because you will desire to have a different, something that God will speak to you about, a fresh and a new. That God will bless you and strengthen you. For in the time of trouble... He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. <laughs> Another way to translate that, he will be my stronghold. <laughs> he will be my stronghold. You know, David knew a lot about strongholds. He had built Jerusalem into a stronghold with big walls, the capital city had taken much of what had come in through taxation and stuff and made this, the city of Jerusalem a, a secure and a beautiful place up on the hill. But he said, our real security is God. There's a song we sing here. I'll tell you what, how the song came to be, just a little brief history of it. We sing this song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Book or never moving. I mean, God is so secure. Martin Luther wrote that song after he first had rebelled against the Catholic Church and they had actually sent people to kill him. He said, churches shouldn't do that. You're right. Churches shouldn't send people to kill other people, but this was a very dark time in the Catholic Church. And the Protestant Reformation was just beginning. Protest, Protestant protesters, that's why we're called Protestants, because we protested against, against the Catholics. And he was brought in by one of the princes in Germany to protect him. And he finally, through much prayer, said, I'm going to go back to my church and I'm going to preach and I'm going to get out of this castle. And that's when, the, that's when he wrote that song, that God was his mighty fortress. And I think that's what David is saying here. God is my mighty fortress. He shall set me up on a rock. Hallelujah. This is, as I said, this is, this is a song of confidence. And you can feel the confidence all the way through it. And now shall my head be lifted up and mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer this, in his, I will offer his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Not only will he bring his sacrifices, make his animal sacrifices, he is going to come and sing songs. <laughs> Guys, David had a single heart, but he had also a singing heart. <laughs> he might be saying, you may think I'm too old for the army, but God's my stronghold and I'm going to sing a song. 
Do y'all ever sing songs to Jesus? I do. I do. Sometimes I sing songs that we sing here, Brother Daddy, but sometimes I make up my own as I go along. Yep. Hey, sing me a song. I sing song, and I, I'm not going to because my voice is not really very good and I can't sing at all, but I'll tell you some of the words. Sometimes I sing, Lord, I'm glad that you love me. Lord, I'm glad that I'm here today. And just I just sing stuff, whatever comes in my head, I just sing it loud as I can. Just sing it out to him and praise his name. And you know what? It's not the beauty of our voices. It's, it's, he says he loves to hear us just sing praises unto him. Make a joyful noise, he said. And I don't know if anybody's going to be more happy than I am to sing praises and tell him about how great that he is and how much I love him. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek my face, my heart said unto, me, unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. I love that. The Lord says, seek my face. So I said, let's seek the face of the Lord, you know. Wouldn't it be nice if it was all that simple in life? If the Lord says, you know, you need to spend some time with me in prayer. <clears throat> you wouldn't say, Lord, you know how much I got to do today. You know how busy person I am? I, I, I. I gotta take care of my husband. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. Or some guy said, "I'm the busiest man in McDowell." Can you know what? If you're too busy to take time for God, something's wrong with you. I'm just telling you that right now. I mean, I know if if, if you can't let other people down. I mean, if you're supposed to be hauling coke from one place to another, you, but God, you can still then say, "I'm gonna make me some time." God's calling me to prayer. It's a time of prayer, and I better go pray. Or pray as you're driving your truck. Pray as you're going through the day. Make time. to. If he says meditate on my word, doesn't mean you have to pull over and start reading it. You know enough of the word of God to start just thinking about it, chewing it. All the word meditate means is just, is just chew it up, chew it up, chew it up. Take it down until it, chew it up, and chew it up again. Just do it. You'll be glad that you were faithful and you responded to what God told you to do. If he told you to sit down and shut up, sit down and shut up. If he tells you to read the Bible, read the Bible. That just seems like a very simple, and this guy's a king now, so he's got, he's got an agenda, he's got work he's got to do. But you said, seek my face. So thy face, Lord, will I seek. <laughs> Pretty simple in life. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. I'm sure he feels somewhat a little depressed because of the army. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me. Now, I don't know that they ever did. We do know that David, before he was even anointed as king, even over part of the Israel and then finally over all of Israel, when Saul was hunting him, he took his mom and dad and took them to, uh, to Moab, remember? In, in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, that must have been difficult for them to lift because it said that his sons, David's brothers and nephews, stayed with David. So here he is leaving behind. Jesse's leaving behind his sons and grandsons, old as David, some of them older than David, He's leaving behind all the males in his family. He's an old man. And I don't know if David ever gets to see them again. I don't know. I don't think that he's saying that his mom and dad did forsake him. It's just when my mom and dad and my mother forsake me, if that's how you feel. Because the last time we saw them now has been when David would write this hymn would have been over 40 years ago when he left them in Moab. We never see them again, but we just assume that they eventually came back, that they lived. But we don't know that they lived long enough to see him quit running from Saul. Then teach, then, then the Lord will I take, will take me up. If my mother and father were to forsake me, the Lord would still take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a path plain because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over to the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a second. 
I don't know, because I didn't notice this until probably about the fourth or fifth time I read this. He's saying, my mother and father, what, what do you want from your mother and father? I wrote down one, two, three, four things here, okay? That most people want from their mother and father. And you'll see all of these right here. One thing, we want to be accepted. Verse 9, he's saying, don't forsake me, don't leave me. We want to be heard. I will seek your face. We want guidance. Verse 11, teach me in the right path, O Lord. Everything that a mom or dad would do, he's asking God to do for him. I want protection. We want mom and dad to give us protection as we're children. Deliver me out of the will of my enemies. Verse 12, And we want God to love us. Even if your parents were to fail you, God will accept you hear you, guide you, protect you, and love you. God is a perfect parent. All right, come to the close of this one. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he puts out a word out here to everybody else, not just for himself. Wait on the Lord. This is a device for all of us reading this. this Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He's encouraging us, others, to wait on the Lord. Wait. Many of God's promises have a long date on them. Stuff he's promised Abraham was not fulfilled for 600 years. Some of the things that God says have a long date before we see them fulfilled. So be patient. Wait on God. But in verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed. What believed what? that I would see goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's not talking about the earth right now. When this little Hebrew phrase, in the land of the living, is a way they would refer to heaven. And I start thinking, about what a weird thing to say. In the land of the living. But you know what? There are more people dead on this earth, buried or rotted away, than there are alive today. Mm -hmm. I mean, about eight, seven billion of us now, somewhere in that neighborhood, or we're at eight billion. I don't know. There's, I remember in 1983 we turned five billion, but then I think by now, I think last year we turned seven billion. There are more people buried in the ground. Over two billion during the days of Noah died, just like that. I counted all the millions that had died before that. You think about that. And plus all the seven billion of us walking around right now, you know what we all got in common? We're all dying. If Jesus tarries his coming, we're all dying. <laughs> so I guess this is a good way. You don't think that's a pleasant thought to have, Debbie? I was just thinking one is closer. <laughs> oh, Debbie. Debbie's trying to take Ray's side now. Ray, I think you're okay now. Yeah. I think now she's out. she's gunning for Debbie now, not you, Ray, okay? Say one is a little closer than her. Okay. <laughs> We don't know. I'm helping you out here, Wanda. Mean dad. You're mean afraid dead. of Yeah, you got that right. All right, so. But we are all in the land of the dying. But heaven is truly the land of the living. We'll go there and we'll never die again. Hallelujah. Psalm 28. All right. This is a psalm because my prayer was answered. Plain and simple. I'm going to read this to you. And you'll see this whole psalm is he said, thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, not a rock, my rock. <laughs> be not silent to me. We'll go back and go through it in a minute. Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry unto thee. When I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked, and with the workers of iniquity, which speak uh, peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds, according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert. Not something sweet. Their just deserves. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor, operation, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Those that are not heard of God. But listen. 
Blessed be the Lord because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength, my shield, my heart trust in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. Will I praise him? The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. There, that's you and me. Who's the there? I'm the there. You're the there. The anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up for lift them up for their forever. All right, so, all right, so, he starts out with his prayer, Lord, please hear me, Lord, please hear me. Don't let me be like the, the ones that don't believe in you. I want to trust in you. Then verse 6, he hits the high note. You know, sometimes we pray prayers and we get them at you before we come up off the floor. <laughs> yep. We do. Sometimes we pray prayers that we pray for years and years. We should praise Him every day, even for the prayers we haven't seen answers to yet. Or maybe He said no and we just aren't listening. I prayed one prayer so long that the Lord actually told me, spoke to my heart. I feel like I don't pray that anymore. So I don't. But you know, guys, we praise Him for the prayers that He says no to. We praise Him for the prayers that we're yet to see answered. But there's something special about, now you got to admit, there's something special about when you pray for something and you see it happen. <laughs> that is amazing. That is when you just want to have a special praise and hallelujah to God. That's what this is. This is a praise because my prayer was heard. Wow, God, you answered me. I know how that feels, and you know how that feels. You prayed those prayers before the day was over. You saw the answer. Before you got up off, finished praying, the phone rang and you had to answer to your prayers. I mean, it's a miracle, isn't it? God does that kind of stuff. I wish it happened every time I prayed. Man, a life, wouldn't that be something? Maybe if we always prayed the right things, it would. But anyhow, I'm just saying, get over yourself. When God answers a prayer and you get that answer immediately, you should praise Him. <laughs> You should just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so let's, let's go through. Be not silent to me. Actually, your Hebrew, your translation may say, be not silent from me. It, it, it's a, this, again, it's a Hebrewism. In other words, if I, if, if, if I don't hear from you, it's probably because you're not hearing me. So, so don't, don't be silent to me. Or don't be silent from me. Both are correct in the Hebrew, okay? Lest if you be silent, and I don't hear from you, and you don't hear from me, I would feel like one of those that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication, my crying out, my specific... Supplications, by the way, when people do a study, I, I preached this message several years ago, the different kinds of prayers that we could pray. Supplications are very specific. In the Old Testament, that's what the Hebrew word means. In the New Testament, the New Testament word means in the Greek. Something very specific you're praying. So something's on his mind. When I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Now, guys, i got to tell you. Some people just do not like lifting their hands to the Lord. And they say, oh, I didn't know. Because I, I could see some of y'all when I said Sunday morning, let's lift our hands up and praise the Lord. Some of y'all go, you're kind of scared, you know. You know, guys, you don't have to be scared. I wrote down here so I tried, so you won't be as scared, okay? What does it mean when you lift up your hands? Well, in the military, you expect somebody to lift their hands up because they're surrendering, and you should be surrendering to Jesus. Well, my little nephews run to me. They got them hands straight up in there. You know what that means? Pick me up, Uncle Daniel. <laughs> Pick me up, old pops. <laughs> Pick me up. You know. Well, that's what I want to do too when I raise my hand. I want the Lord to lift me up. Pick me up. Then there's another one. And you'll see this occasionally, especially in athletic events. I've noticed the, the winners of the little sections of the Tour de France, they're riding those bicycles. First thing they cross that field, hands go up in the air. They're just so, it's a sign of victory in the military, not the ones that you can point the gun at, but you know, that's just a common thing. Yeah, victory, yes, we won. 
Sometimes closed fences, sometimes open. Usually when you're surrendering, it's open. But guys, I'm sure there's many more, but that's all I just jotted down yesterday was, or day before yesterday. Lift up your hands because it means you surrender to God. You want Him to lift you up and you know He is your victory. Hallelujah. I'm sure there's dozens of other reasons, but just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to lift up your hands and just say thank you to the Lord or, or praise Him or pray. Let nothing wrong with lifting your hands when you pray, surrendering to Him. All right. It's not wrong for us to desire holiness and righteousness because verse 3 through 5 upsets a lot of people. Give, verse 4, give according to their deeds, according to the weakness of their endeavors. It's, 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 this is not a precatory psalm. Remember precatory psalms where David, we've got some of those in our outline. That's when David prays the whole psalm, punish the wicked, punish the wicked, punish the wicked. Well, it's not wrong for us to want righteousness in our world, church. It's just not. We should want the unjust to be punished. Now, let me tell you this to you, okay? I've got some things written down here, okay? It's not wrong to desire holiness and righteousness in this present world. We should desire to see evil punished. But like David, we should leave this in God's hands and not ours. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, thus saith the Lord. It's not your job to go out and punish people. I mean, unless, of course, you were a policeman or something like that. But I mean, it's not our job on our own as citizens to go out and beat people because they committed adultery. It would be nice for Somebody did stuff like that, you know. But uh, also, we should pray that our fleshly tendencies will be destroyed by God because you know who the worst enemy I have is? Me. And we, so, you know, there's, when we point the finger at somebody else, remember, three more is pointing back at you, you know. You may not be guilty of their sins, but you do have your own. Also, then, a third thing is, remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So don't be too angry at the drug addicts. You can be. We, we want them to be punished. We want them to get help. But remember, it's the demons behind that that we're fighting against. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. So keep that in mind, okay? Then verse 6, he just starts praising God. Praise God. I got the answer to my prayer. He hath heard the voice of my supplications. That those supplications, those specific prayers I was praying, he heard it. The Lord is my strength, my shield, my heart trust. You know, we feel that way all the time. But you've got to admit, when you get a specific prayer answered, it feels really good. It just feels good. You pray for somebody to get saved, the phone rings, they say, hey, last Sunday night, so-and-so got saved. For somebody you've been Wanted to see get healed. You could get the news, Facebook or somebody else, call and tell you, man, you know you've been praying for your cousin for so long, and now all is gone. How did y'all feel when Sister Cheryl announced that they said that everything was in remission? I, I felt a victory. I felt an answer to prayer. I felt the hallelujah. That's why I said, let's, some, I mean, somebody said, let's give the Lord a round of applause. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands. I mean, my goodness, praise his holy name. Because it's not just David. He didn't say the Lord is just David's strength. What's he say in verse 8? It's their strength. Who's the their? The, his anointed. You, me, believers. All right. Now, Psalm 29. Oh, I should say one more thing. I, uh, I wanted to point this out. Feed them also and lift them up forever. The word feed them there, I wish the King James would do it. Because I don't know if anybody did a better job. I didn't check any other translations on this. It's actually the word raha, uh, rea, shepherd. Why did he not put shepherd them also? Does, does your translation, Brother Jeremy, in verse in verse 9 of 28? Be their shepherd also. Okay, good. See, I should have checked some other. Because that's what it is. It's being the shepherd. Not just feeding us, but actually, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Did the NIV get the shepherd right there? Yes. Good, good. I should have checked some other translations. It's, it's the word shepherd. Rea, shepherd them. And, and here's another little sh uh, shepherding tool. Lift them up forever. Uh, the shepherd, you know, we talked about this when we did Psalm 23. He would take the, the lamb of the lead you, and when he would carry that, 
then she would follow, then every all the other sheep would follow, you know. So so he said, Lift me up, carry me, Lord, take carry me to where I need to go. Psalm twenty nine. All right. What a psalm. Psalm twenty nine. David wrote this when he was very young. Probably probably when he was a teen, early twenties at the latest. David writes many psalms on clear, bright nights, and he talks about the stars shining and the beauty of the world all around him. But this psalm is a psalm of a storm. Verse 3, The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. The glory of God, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice breaks the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like calf. Makes the earth to shake from lightning. Lebanon and, and Syrian like a, like a young unicorn. So he's got all this going on. But he writes this one in the storm. Maybe he's writing it from the caves of En Gedi. Maybe he writes it before, as soon as he's anointed by Samuel and he has to go by and start keeping his father's sheep again. But this is something, the voice of the Lord. This, this psalm, actually, you can actually see how it's written. The first two verses is praise. Just praise to God. No, no limits bar. The last two verses, praise to God. But then you have these verses, these seven verses in the middle here. And these verses are all about the voice of God. God's voice over the voice, the voice, the voice. Uh, the Lord shakes with verse 9 the voice. I'll, we'll see it as we read that okay and I'll read the whole thing to you here in just a second seven times a voice of God full of power and glory alright let's start let me read the whole thing first and then we'll go back give unto the Lord O ye mighty give unto the Lord glory and strength give unto the Lord the glory of his unto his due unto his name Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's just worship, worship, worship. Now we have the body of it here. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. <coughs> The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. He's talking about the volcanoes the, 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 under the crest of the earth. Uh, crest of the earth. The, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness of an earthquake. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf, the, the, the wild uh, deer to calf. He brings life. The voice of the Lord brings life. And discovereth the forest. In his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. We'll, we'll, I'll explain that in a minute. The Lord set up upon the flood. Yea, the Lord is set up king forever. The Lord giveth strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now you couldn't help but notice the word, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. If you have a legacy translation, which is the newest of the, king, of the New American Standard Bible, <laughs> it's called it the legacy translation, translated by the college there where uh, Dr. John MacArthur is the, is the uh, president emeritus of. But anyhow, it, is, uh, it would have said this all the way through. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Because they never translated the Lord, this particular translation, every time in the Old Testament and New Testament, where it's capital L-O-R-D, they translate it literally. Yahweh, Yahweh. Or we would say Jehovah. It, I, I was hearing two different preachers on this right here recently, actually. And one of them said, the Lord, that means Jehovah. He's an older guy. Then I heard somebody, the Lord, that means Jehovah. It's according to how old you are, I guess. Both of those are Hebrew words. It's uh, just according to how you pronounce the, the first letter, okay? So so I'm going to probably say Jehovah, but the, but the legacy Bible says Yahweh all the way through. Eighteen times in 11 verses, it says Jehovah. This is a psalm about Jehovah. That's exciting. This is Jehovah's psalm. If you want to know what psalm is Jehovah's psalm, this is a psalm. Psalm 29. Praise to Jehovah. Praise to Jehovah. All right. Start reading. 
Give unto the Lord. 18 times. Jehovah. Oh, ye mighty. What is the mighty supposed to give to him? Give unto Jehovah glory and strength. Now, who are the mighty? I should. I didn't check anybody else's translation. How does yours translate that, Jeremy, on verse 1? Uh, oh, ye mighty. Oh, sons of the mighty. Sons of the mighty. It's pretty good. Not exactly completely right. Ray, how's the NIV do it? Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. O oh, mighty ones. Okay. Ascribe, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Okay. It's actually, it's a little closer in the, in the, in the ESB. I, I didn't check it. Any of them. It's actually the same phrase that's used in the book of Job as sons of God or in the book of Genesis, sons of God, talking about the angels. This is the this is the angels. It says you heavenly beings. Heavenly beings, all right. Yes, it it it's it's the angels of God. Give unto the Lord, the sons of God. Literally in the Hebrew, sons of God. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. And I just wrote this down because that's in the book of Genesis. But in the book of Revelation, chapter four, verse eight, it says, "The four living creatures rest not day nor night." But cried, here's a quote from King James, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You know, they're not programmed to say that. It's, when they're around the throne of God, it's every time they say a new facet of God, which is always God, never is the same. He is always so beautiful and mind-blowing. These four living creatures that are there, Day and night say, holy, 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 except for when there's silence in heaven. A few places you'll read, silence in heaven. Even they must hush. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're amazed at who God is, and they say that. Verse 2, give unto the Lord the glory to his name. It's not that we make God more glorious. We just recognize the glory that he has. We can never, when we say give glory to God, we could never. We don't have any glory to give God, do we? So what we're doing is recognizing his glory that he already has. Give glory, recognize his glory, do unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I love how the King James says that. In the beauty of holiness, in the completeness, in the totality, with nothing lacking, nothing could be missing. Worship God with everything. I'm going to go to the end. Then I want to do the body out one time. So I'm going to go to the other praise. So first two verses of praise, last two verses of praise. The Lord set up upon the flood. Only time this word is used outside the book of Genesis is right here. It's the flood. He's talking about the flood that when God destroyed all of mankind except for Noah and his family. Sometimes we'll use Noah's flood. I mean, we call it Noah's flood, but Noah didn't do it. He just survived it, you know. So, uh, but this is Noah's flood. The Lord set it upon that flood. It was no accident. It had never even rained before. God turned the fountains loose underneath the earth and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine the thundering and the lightning? What they must have thought. They would never even heard anything. Seen rain before. Yea, the Lord setteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people. I love this. What a way to end his psalm with peace. And ain't that what the world needs today? Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at the body of the psalm. The voice, the voice, seven times the voice. I want to I want to say this, what I, the notes I have written now, so I, I want to just get to this. The voice of the Lord is a terrifying thing. When Moses and the children of Israel were around the mountain, God gives them, we all, I know Charles Heston and his Ten Commandments up in the mountain, but God gives them the commandments and then remember God actually writes the commandments for Moses. That's the part we see up on the mountain. The children of Israel said to Moses after hearing God speak, we don't want to ever hear God speak again. You go listen to God, Moses, and then come and tell us what he says. We'll trust you. So Aaron and Moses and then Joshua after that, they would go to the tent of hearing and they would hear from God. And sometimes God would still speak to the whole nation, would terrify them. But, so the voice of God is terrifying. But I think about another time about the voice of God. 
Elijah is running away. He should not. He just had a great, great victory up on Mount Carmel. He's running away. And God gives him a miraculous meal that holds him for 40 days, 40 nights. He finds himself in a cave and he says, you know, he sees the thunder and the lightning, the wind, the fire, all those things. Earth is quaking. He said, God was not in that. How did God speak to him that day? Still small voice. God spoke to him in a still small voice. So whether he's thundering or a still small voice, how does he speak to us today? I will hold it up so you can see. This is how he speaks to us today. This book right here. That's how he speaks to us. This is his voice. All right, let's see the beauty of his poetry here now. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory, thunder. Can you just imagine young David? It may have been one of the first 10 or 12, 15 or 50 poems that he ever wrote. I don't know. But young David is writing this. The thunder is coming down. The Lord speaks. The voice of the Lord upon the waters. The rain is falling down. The glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Yes, it is. I'm going to say it again. The Bible is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The Bible is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Cedars of Lebanon, there's only a few of them left in the world now. They're over 200 foot high. They're not as large as our American sequoias, but in the Middle East, you're in the highest part of the whole Middle East there up on Mount Hermon and up in the mountains of Lebanon. Snow is there. You think about all the heat and everything, the desert of, uh, that's part of the wilderness of Judea, even though much of Israel is, is very green. But, you get to, but then you have that mountain. You can look and see the snow. It always amazes me. It amazed me when we were in Alaska a few weeks ago to see 70 degrees where we're at. And you look up, you see all those snow-covered mountains everywhere. It's just, it kind of blows your mind, you know. So he's saying... Even the great Le Le cedars of Lebanon are nothing. And God strikes them. Lightning just tears them apart. Blasts them apart. He makes them to skip like a calf. Can you just imagine this in David's mind? He's seeing a big tree get struck with lightning, bouncing across the wilderness that's busted up. Have any of y'all ever been around lightning? Any of you ever been struck with lightning? No, okay. Well, the closest I ever came, my, my cousin Tommy was struck with lightning three times. Uh, he was equipment operator up on top of a strip, and three times he was struck with lightning. Cracked his helmet, uh, his uh, hard hat open completely one time. But yeah, all right. Coach Taylor and I were golfing at Clear Fork several years ago, and the rain starts. And what does it say? Don't go under trees when the rain starts. So we go under a tree there. There's a couple other guys on the dog leg, Ray. We're on number 16 heading up. And we're parked on this tree. I'm, boom! Can't see anything for like three or four seconds. I don't know. He's completely blinded. I thought Coach was dead. Big chunk of a, that tree flew off. Smacked him in the side like that. I, I'm hearing all this. I can't see anything. The guys that was over on the dog leg are hung over there. They thought we both was dead. Anybody over there? Well, they could see we was there. They just didn't know if we was there anymore, you know. It's a very terrifying thing, you know. But we didn't get hit. The tree did. It's, that was enough for us. That was close enough. So now we don't park under trees, okay? So anyhow. But he's saying, I see this busting apart. This world is a beautiful. It's beautiful. The voice of the Lord divides the flames. He, he's the one that, uh, that, that, that has the earthquakes and the, and, and, the, uh, and, and the volcanoes and the flames of fire. Wow. And you know what? By the way, this uh, Psalm 29, yet to this day, is sung every Pentecost by Jewish homes. Religious Jews, all Jews celebrate the Passover, whether religious or not. It's a cultural thing. But in religious homes on Passover, on, on Pentecost, they sing Psalm 29. What look at it says? Flames of fire. What happened on the, on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost after Jesus died? The tongues of fire came down upon the... I wonder if they were actually singing this when it happened to them. I don't know. 
because there were 120 of them gathered together for fear of the Jews, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Hallelujah. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh, all the way to the mighty mountains, all the way up in Lebanon and Syrian, verse 6. The voice of the Lord makes the, the wild animals hear the deer, the ibex, the calf, and discovers the forest. And the forest is made alive by God. And in his temple, and of course his tabernacle, David's not even had it moved yet. David's not even king yet. But he's, he's just come from a very religious family. No doubt they had been to, to, the, to the temple. I mean to the to the Ark of the Covenant, to the tabernacle. Doth every one speak of his all around how God told Moses to build the, the tabernacle was all of spoke of the glory of God. From the top, everything on the outside, everything on the inside was the glory of God. And what he's saying is, that's beautiful, but so is nature. <laughs> nature is beautiful too. Both speak of the glory of Almighty God. <laughs> Wow. God is something, isn't he? I think about the things that Debbie and I have been blessed to see in our life. I remember down on the big island in Hawaii watching the, the lava run into the ocean. And big pieces as big as semi trucks fall into the ocean. Smoke coming up. And watching that red river flow out into the ocean. It blows your mind. Or in Alaska, when you go up into Glacier Bay and the boats there and glaciers are calving, they call it breaking apart. Rivers, I mean, bigger than, big as this whole side of the church just come flowing, that fresh water flowing out of that. That's something, guys. People always ask me, what's the prettiest thing you've ever seen? And I always say the same thing. Southern West Virginia. <laughs> Man alive. Can anything beat Southern West Virginia in the spring? Or in the fall? <laughs> We're in the summer as green as it is. I mean, we're in the snow-covered mountains. No wonder they, the nick, one of the nicknames of West Virginia is the Little Alps, you know. Guys, we've seen a lot of beautiful stuff in this world, ain't we? I mean, right here in McDowell County, the ocean. Most of y'all have been to the ocean and saw how big and mighty that it looks and everything. That's our God. That's our God. That's how I'm going to end this thing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings for the, that you pour out upon us. I pray, Lord God, help us to do your will. Thank you for these psalms. If it can be your will, and I pray that's not, I pray you come and get us before next week. We'll look one more time in them for this summer. Pick it up again next if it's your will. Lord Jesus, please come and get us. We do love you. We praise you. Thank you for your promises. Proud good you are to us. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Yes, we do. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.